By adding your community's information to the state's new marketing platform that Lieutenant Governor Husted unveiled earlier today, you can increase the access to the plans that you have for your Opportunity Zone. And at the Development Services Agency, we have people who can walk you through it and help if you have any questions. Uh, we also uh, want to make sure that you have our best efforts at identifying other elements of an incentive package to make your Opportunity Zone projects viable. So joining us now is a panel of professional advisors with experience in tax, real estate, and financial incentives. And many are calling the Qualified Opportunity Zones incentive the, quote, largest capital gains incentive in a generation. Compliance with the rules and timing are so critical. And if it's done right, the investors may be partners in your community for a decade. If it's a good experience, they may look for other opportunities with you. So to help you understand what makes a good experience, we've brought together this panel of advisors. And you will certainly find complete biographies in your program. But I am pleased to introduce the following. Gary Hekimovic is a partner in the Washington National Tax Office of Deloitte Tax LLP. He has more than 26 years of public accounting experience, specializing in federal income tax credits and incentives. Ekimovic and his team provide structuring, application writing, and transactional consulting with respect to federal income tax incentives, including qualified opportunity zones. Thank you very much. Gary Karp, or Jennifer Karp, sorry, is a member of the business practice group at the law firm of Murray, Murphy, Mool, and Basil, LLP, where she assists clients with business transactions and agreements, including mergers, stock and asset acquisitions, real estate financing, purchase, sale, and lease agreements, loan transactions, joint ventures, and other collaborations, as well as general corporate matters, if we've left anything out. <laughs> And Stephen M. Lukinovich is a certified public accountant at MCM, where he leads the real estate and transportation logistics services team and serves as a member of the tax services department. Lukinovich is a personal financial specialist and a certified valuation analyst. He is the co-founder of the Midwest Opportunity Zone Forum and treasurer of the Urban, or the Urban Land Institute. Welcome our panel of experts. Hi guys. Hi. Welcome. Hey. We are super happy to have subject matter experts such as yourself here uh, to be able to share your expertise and your insights as, um, as we venture out as local communities and economic development professionals and as a state uh, in this world of opportunity zones. So if I could just ask each of you to kind of give a, a general uh, thought on what you think uh, this means uh, for not only investors, uh, but also communities uh, moving uh, into the future. Well, good afternoon. I'm Stephen. It's good to be with you. Great audience. And I understand many of you are, you know, economic development individuals in your community. And like the other panelists we're talking about, and as, as, as you're sort of gaining an, an insight to this, the Opportunity Zone incentive is one incentive of many. And this alone will not normally trip the scale for a developer to do a project in a community. It's, that's not the way it's going to work. It's going to be this incentive. And at some point, Lydia, I think we probably should remind the audience exactly what the incentive is so they can hear it, and we'll do that at some point. But nevertheless, this is one of many. And so, yes, in your community, you need to think about um, that when you're talking to developers and entrepreneurs. Hi, I'm Jen. I'm excited to be here today. Thank you so much for your time. Um, as a real estate attorney, typically I deal with investors uh, who are looking to put up real estate developments, typically commercial, some mixed use. And I'm really excited about this tax incentive because I think that investors are looking for just a little bit more of an edge in terms of where they're building and what they're doing. Uh, so I think this has the potential to have a really great impact on some of the communities in Ohio, as well as um, a benefit for my clients. Hi, everyone. I'm Gary Hekmovich at Deloitte. Uh, I've been practicing tax law for over 26 years, and I've touched every tax incentive in the federal tax code. And I can tell you that the excitement for the Qualified Opportunity Zone incentives really is off the charts. Um, 
there's really nothing short of dying that allows you to get the benefits of not paying tax on appreciated property. Um, Sounds like a great thing. I don't want to <laughs> die, so I'd much rather invest in a qualified opportunity fund. Um, so re really excited. This I've done a lot of these panels. I mean, kudos to Ohio and everything you guys are doing here. I was saying a little earlier, I've been to Columbus probably four or five times now. So th this, this community is very active, and you guys are at the forefront on qualified opportunity zones. So thanks for having us. Great, great. So Stephen, you, you bring up a really good point because I'm sure there are a couple of people out there that are like, what in the heck is this tax incentive uh, that you're talking about? Um, so you're on the spot. Uh, let's, let's in a nutshell um, cover what, what, the, what the incentive is and, and why, why it's, an, it's advantageous. Well, thank you. So as you know, it was part of the uh, federal tax reform passed December 22nd, uh, 2017, effective 1118, uh, substantially. So what is it? It really is an investor incentive. So the way I describe it, the best way I think uh, someone should hear this, in my opinion, is to sort of look at it this way. If an investor has in their portfolio, so that's an individual, so if an individual has in their portfolio, a stock portfolio, they have IBM stock, and the IBM stock is appreciated, and for some reason they're looking to sell it. So if they sell the stock for $100,000 and it creates a $30,000 gain, you cannot take that $30,000 gain and roll that into other stock and avoid paying tax on that $30,000 gain. You cannot do that. You can do that if it's real estate. You can roll over gains in real estate. Most of you are probably familiar with that. That's called like kind exchanges. That did um, survive tax reform for real estate. You can do that. For stock gains, however, you cannot. Unless you take that gain, and you don't have to take the $100,000 proceeds. You only have to take the $30,000 gain. If you take the $30,000 gain within six months and put that into a fund, which is nothing more than a partnership, that's all we're talking about, put that into a partnership, uh, either a partnership that you perhaps and your wife own or some friends own, or you can put it in someone else's partnership, but you take that $30,000 gain and put it into a opportunity zone partnership. That then uh, defers the tax on the gain for seven years. And there's a magic date, 12-31-2019, we'll talk about that, but just in general rules, that defers paying tax on the gain for 30 years, or for seven years, excuse me, for seven years. So 30, We'd like 000, it to be 30 years. Well, I, I think that it, would be even better, wouldn't it? it? Hire a good accountant, we'll make it 100 years. You know what I'm saying. <laughs> we might die before yeah, then. Yeah, I know it. Yeah. I mean, Deloitte knows how to do this, is what I'm saying. <laughs> so, nevertheless, okay. So you get a seven-year deferral. You get a seven-year tax deferral and a 15% haircut. So seven-year clients love that. You tell a client you don't have to pay tax for seven years. They generally love that as long as they have the cash in the seventh year to pay the tax. It's all good. And they get a 15% haircut. So side one of the coin is roll over the gain, seven-year deferral, 15% haircut. That's side one of the incentive. 15% haircut, seven-year deferral, paying tax on the $30,000 gain. The second, which is the home run, you keep the investment for three more years. So in my example, seven years, three more years. You keep the investment in the Opportunity Zone Fund for three more years, 10 years, and then sell out. The gain is tax-free. And the, the home run that Gary alluded to, and there was another investor, um, one of the panelists alluded to, the home run, this is probably why Donald Trump has not released his tax returns, I might add, is the home run is to be able to take the depreciation deduction and get a tax benefit for that. And by the way, there's, there's nuances with that to do that right, which is maybe we'll get into that. But the home run is to get the depreciation deduction and the tax free on the back end. It's a double benefit. All right, that's my piece. I think you did well because I'm, I'm pretty sure I heard out here some enlightenment because I heard, wow. So well done. I think they get it now. You all understand it a little bit better at this point, right? I see Mayor Brown shaking his head. Yes, that's good. Success. All right, Jen, when you're putting a deal team together to get transactions funded and closed in a reasonable time period, what are the key ingredients 
so that the deal doesn't get stale and die? Okay, so I've been thinking about this question, and <laughs> if I were advising a client of mine who maybe had a fund, had some people they want, some friends they wanted to also invest, you've got to set up the fund, you've got to make sure it's compliant in terms of the form of the entity, um, so that you're eligible from the outset to make the investment and get the tax benefit. Uh, then you've got to document what the relationship is for the management of the fund. You know, what sort of payments does the manager get? Um, when there are distributions of proceeds, what's the preferred return for other investors? So there's a lot of contractual negotiation just around setting up the investment. Now you've got the vehicle, you've still got to go out and find the project. Or maybe you knew what the project was, but you've got to acquire it still. Long story short, things will go wrong, regardless of whether you have all of the key ingredients. And it will never be the thing that you thought might go wrong. You might anticipate things will be problems. Those ultimately are not the big problems. It's the unknowns that pop up during the deal. But that's part of what makes it fun because it's a challenge. So the best thing that you can do is set up a deal team that has the expertise to address the types of issues that you're likely to see. Because if you have qualified professionals who are working together, they can identify in advance a lot of things that could have been problems and at least get rid of those. Um, and when I say deal team, I think people typically think of their advisors, right? Their attorneys, their accountants, um, you know, their financial advisors. But I think the group that needs to be part of that deal team from start to finish is bigger than that. Um, it's kind of like a winning sports team. You need strong individual players, but you need the right player to do the right thing with the right intensity you know, at the perfect time. So everybody's got a different role, but you're all ultimately working together. And I would say that's the sponsor, the other investors, accountants, attorneys, but I think it's also the developer, the community. Um, if there are members of local government that are involved in zoning variances or you know, other things in connection with the development, keeping them in the loop and treating them as part of the deal team or maybe as an advisor to the deal team is the best thing you can do to make sure things go smoothly. Well, as a former athlete, I love uh, the putting the right team together. Uh, and that's actually how uh, internally we've been talking about, you know, how this is going to be successful. It's not just any one individual or any one in, in individual community. It's going to take uh, a variety of backgrounds. So thank you uh, for, for that contribution. Gary, uh, investors appeared to be awaiting the second round of guidance from the U.S. Treasury uh, before jumping in. We got that last week, I think. Uh, what did we learn from that guidance that came and what that communities uh, need to know in order to make their opportunity zones attractive? Okay, so, so this, there's, this is a really big deal. What happened last week is the government did release a second set of proposed regulations on the new Qualified Opportunity Zone incentive. Those proposed regulations are reliance regulations, so taxpayers can rely. You don't have to wait for final regulations. This is a really big deal. So in October of last year, essentially they wrote half the story in the regulations while they were working on the second set. And I would go to conferences. We have, we have some 30 clients that have at some stage, they're investing in projects and qualified opportunity zones. And I told everyone in October, December, January, I said, the water's warm, jump on in the pool. And you know, there weren't that many people in the pool. <laughs> I can tell you now. I wonder why. Yeah. With the second set of regulations, they have blown the door off of answering all of the major questions, and then some. Uh, the regulations are complex, they're 196 pages, but like, we, like I've heard all day long, you can take something that's complex, and the more you make it simple, the easier it is to close on a project. So I guess my, my number one piece of advice, starting especially from an economic development standpoint, uh, you know, for cities and mayors and, and local communities is the first thing to do is understand who owns the real estate, who owns the land. Whoever owns that land is sitting on something of value. 
And the minute you understand that, those are the parties that you want to begin negotiating with. The second thing, and to me this is, this is really groundbreaking in the new regulations. The first group of people that were in the pool with me were all real estate developers, many of them here in Columbus. Um, so real estate clearly qualifies. If you build an apartment building, mixed use, commercial, industrial, anything in, within the qualifying zones, the situs of the projects in the zone, you're gonna meet all the, 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 the statutory requirements to be a qualified opportunity zone business. What wasn't as clear was the opportunity for operating businesses to re-domicile existing companies, startups, early stage companies that would bring jobs, manufacturing, and re really there aren't a lot of restrictions about the type of business. You can't be a sin business, so I'm sorry if you own a massage parlor or a golf course. Those are sins. I, I like massages, but I don't think they meant that type of massage. Anyway. But I think casino is not a sin business. I'm sorry, which? But I think a casino does not count as a sin uh, no, business. No, ga gaming is, is actually a sin business. Yeah. Um, so the big change in these regulations was uh, they answered the question about deriving 50% of the gross income from the business within the qualifying zone. And they did that by writing safe harbor rules. And without getting up, we don't have a lot of tax nerds in this audience, so I'll make it as simple as I can make it here. If you have employees that are located at the location of the business in the zone and they earn their wages or they charge their hours inside the zone, even if you're generating income from international operations outside the zone, those things can now qualify as a qualified opportunity zone business. And that is transformative. Um, the world of real estate, we have a hundred some funds that have been formed to match investors with projects in real estate. We're going to now see operate venture capital. And, and this is exciting because when you talk to economic development folks, they're not, they're more concerned about the, the businesses located in, in the areas. It is just the real estate and the leasing. So that's, that's really exciting. You know, that particular aspect, um, was something that Governor DeWine actually had a conversation uh, with the White House about when he was in uh, Washington about a month, uh, month and a half ago. Uh, and he made sure that he shared that, look, if, if we can't get this better defined and open up the opportunity for more than just what originally uh, was outlined, um, then, then we, we won't see the return that we thought or the, the success that we thought. So you're right, uh, absolutely right. So, Stephen, some have called the program uh, an opportunity of a lifetime uh, for investors, uh, but the clock is ticking uh, right now on the program. So what do communities need to do right now to make sure that they get in on some of what Treasury Secretary uh, Steve Mnuchin has projected will be $100 billion in investment this year? Well, thank you. Um, the audience may not know, I, I actually practice outside of Louisville, Kentucky, and um, we have offices in Louisville, Indianapolis, Cincinnati, uh, Lexington. So we have clients that are knee-deep, even when the uh, first, uh, when the law was written prior to even the first set of regs were released, we had clients already forming funds and doing projects. It's interesting, I, I drove up I-71 this morning met with one of our congressmen from uh, Indiana. Anyway, I passed about five opportunity zones. They're called uh, radar from the uh, Ohio State Police. So I thought that was kind of neat. It's all about safety and revenue, I know Steve. it. And uh, one of them, anyway, I won't bore you with all that. So, so here it is. All right, so we mentioned earlier, 12-31-2019 is actually a magical date. It's tied to the seven-year rule and the 15% haircut. And as Gary mentioned and, and Jennifer, we're very fortunate to have these rules released uh, just last week. They defined a lot. Uh, personally, I think a lot of information already existed and you could have, 98% uh, of the funds that needed to be formed could have been formed. There was 2% of the complexity that needed to exist and, and that needed to be clarified and we got that clarified. But 1231-2019 is important because if you don't uh, invest and sell in 2019, say you sell your stock, remember that my 
stock example a minute ago, the IBM stock. If you sell your stock in 2020, you're not going to get the full 15% haircut on the gain. You're only going to get 10% on the gain. And so the t no matter what, the seven-year clock on your deferral of the gain will expire 12-31-2026. So the point is, you're going to have to recognize the gain by 12-31-2026, no matter what, on the sale of any kind of capital gain event. But you won't get the full 15% haircut unless you sell in 2019. Maybe, maybe let me Go jump ahead, in on that, Steve. Yeah. I'm just going to challenge this a little bit because I, I hear this from investors all the time that, you know, and there was a big rush. Let's get the rules out by so people can transact by the end of 2019. And what Stephen said is absolutely true. You lose some of the benefit, the front end benefit of deferring, or of reducing some of the capital gain because the end date is 12-31-2026 when you have to recognize the gain. So you got to hold for seven years. That means you got to make an investment by the end of 2019 to get the full front end benefit. When you actually sit down and you do the numbers on the, the yield, the benefit to the investor, it's not driven by this 5% or a 10% exclusion of the gain. What it's built, driven on is the appreciation. So what when I think about this program and the shelf life for this program as an economic development tool, I'm not worried about a little speed bump at the end of 2019 or the end of 2021. I have one date in mind where everybody here, where the party ends and there's only a couple chairs left and the music stops and everyone's got to find a chair, and that is 12-31-2026. That wasn't even in the originating legislation. That was added to pass in Congress under reconciliation, so the government had to put that date in there. What that means is this is an economic tool for everybody through that date. 12-31-2026, many years from now, is the last date that investors could roll over capital gain, even if they got a one day or a one hour deferral, they still get the benefit of stepping up their basis to fair market value after holding the investment for 10 years. So, so I think that's important to understand. This economic tool is, is around for a while. It's not something that's gonna end at the end of this year. Jen, I'd love to get your feedback uh, on this particular yeah, I agree yeah. that I don't think that it's the 10 to 15 percent that's driving the transactions, but it is nice mm -hmm. to make absolute most of, you know, what the opportunity is. And in order to do that, um, 2019 end of year is the cutoff. Sure. So this question, uh, this next question is for all of you. Um, for a small community, you know, like a Fostoria, um, what are the, you know, three top things to, ki to keep in mind uh, in this process? Steve. Okay. I like going first. So Gary can correct me. I'm joking, Gary. I'm joking. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. And he's, he's totally right. You're absolutely right. I Fair know. and balanced. We both, yeah. our, both of our last names end in Vich, but our haircuts are different. So whatever. Um, <laughs> so it's good. Okay. Here's what I'm thinking. I, th this is a, it's a great question. And I think the communities might appreciate a little bit of this insight. When I was listening to the Athens, uh, the, the mayor, he did a great job, and the other lady, I forget her name, but... Renee. Thank you, Renee. Sorry. Uh, did a great job. What you, in my opinion, can think about, you know, you want to advertise, promote, all of that, get on the Ohio State, uh, the website that's been created, obviously do all of that, show up at the conventions. But what I think you ought to think about doing is the tracks are meaningless to anyone. So if you call it track one, track two, don't do that. Instead, I would personally think about, and some communities have already done this, you ought to name, you could even combine the tracks. So like if the tracks are already combined, give them a name, some sort of distinction in the community. I think, again, I think it was Athens and he mentioned uh, gateway. He mentioned something about a gateway. I'd call one of the tracks Gateway Corridor. That's why I'd call that one. Uh, if it's near the river, the riverfront view, you know. If it, the, there was one near the university, and I'd call that, I mean, this is just me. You're asking me, so I'm going to say I, it. I did, I asked you. I yeah. know you did. Yeah. So I'd say, I'd call that one the univers, University Corridor, you know. 
Um, there's some like the warehouse district, the manufacturing, the industrial park, the, um, you know, and you can think of what, I'd name them, I'd combine them and name them. Don't call them the very census tract that it is. That, no one cares about that. Like Field of Dreams. Yeah, that sounds good. Yeah, yeah. Jen, what do you think? Top three things that uh, smaller communities should keep in mind in this process. Well, one thing that came to mind as I was watching the presentations today, and I believe it was Athens, I really appreciate that people have put thought into what are some things this community could use? What are some ways we could develop this in a way that will work for us? What are our needs? Because as an outsider, you can look at the the acreage and you know whether it's flat or hilly or you know close to water what street it's near and decide if it's good for a particular use but you still need to figure out whether that purpose is going to work in that community and that's something that the insiders know better than anyone else sure Gary thoughts yeah so you're I, okay with census track one and no I'm not okay with two. Census. Yeah. I agree with Stephen. Yeah. Um, absolutely. Uh, having a good name it makes a lot of sense. Uh, you know, I, I go back to, uh, well, really amplifying some of the things we heard here. Um, you know, I, I'm going to come back to harping on who owns the land. It's the first thing you should understand is who controls the property. In some cases, that could be the governmental entity, the university, the hospital, and then you have the assets of the community. That's very important. Then. Think about, you know, just what the master plan, what are we trying to develop locally? And for example, I've, I've heard this done with other local governments where they've concluded that they want to attract in these zones, not so much may, maybe the affordable housing. So they, they have a plan for affordable housing, but we're going to do affordable housing in another area. And we want to reserve these areas for business creation, job creation, etc. So, you know, the, the new rules are very permissive with the types of businesses you can attract. So there's a matching, you know, what are the attributes of your location to the types of businesses you can attract and be, begin to build from there. Um, and then, again, the first step, if you haven't done it, who owns the land? They are in control. Whoever holds the real estate controls things um, from the, from the get-go. Yeah, go ahead. Do you have another one? Believe it or not. Yeah. Okay. Um, just quickly, I'd say, you know, in addition to the explicit uh, industries that are non-qualifying industries for this incentive, there are some, and this was actually mentioned in, I think it, it's Renee, right, in her uh, piece, where she had the residential track. I, I want you to kind of hear this just real quickly, and that is some industries, it actually doesn't make sense for them to be motivated by this incentive. So here's what I mean. If you're a residential home builder and you're gonna develop this uh, acreage, like 25 or 35 acres as a, as a home residential plot, at the end of 10 years, you don't have anything. You've sold all the houses. There's no appreciation on the back end for which to take advantage of the incentive. So I just wanna suggest residential houses that are not rental, is likely not a good candidate for this. Secondly, condominiums. Condominiums that are pure condominium complexes. So if somebody's gonna do a high rise or some sort of you know, mid rise on the river and it's pure condominiums that are up for sale, that too is probably not a good uh, industry, good asset class. Again, if it's rental real estate, if it's apartment, multifamily, that's a home run. You know, that, that'll make a lot of sense. So I'm just submitting, you need to think about the different industries too. Yeah, so like um, you know, multi-family uh, residential condominiums uh, that overlook the reservoir. It's a perfect spot for that kind of stuff with a lot of amenities, right, to drive people. Well, of course, yes. yes, of course. So, um, you know, one of the things that I heard today that I, I'd love to get your feedback on, because I know we, we've, we've focused a lot on real estate, um, because clearly where the, where the investment happens is important uh, in this conversation. But I think it was Jonathan Tower from, who, from um, Art, Art Terrace, that's right. He said, uh, he was talking about, don't overlook um, the uh, operations or the ability to um, infuse capital uh, from an outside entity to buy a company or bring a business in that isn't necessarily tied to the real estate. 
Um, that's something that I have not heard a lot of people talk about. Uh, that's, it's a lot about placemaking and how we, you know, create these environments that's conducive for investment uh, to try and, you know, turn up uh, and, and make recovery happen in these areas. But there's been, there's been little conversation, at least in, in my circles, about uh, this business uh, perspective. And of course, with the changes uh, that came uh, forth uh, last week, uh, it's obviously uh, a game changer uh, in that space. So Gary, I don't know what your thoughts are uh, on that. Yeah, no, I, I mean, this, this is relatively new, so the, the rules are much, you know, people have sort of been down the path and taken a f few laps around the pool in real estate. Um, the, 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 the rules make it, you know, crystal clear that there are two parties that can benefit. So this is the way I like to think. The owner of the real estate, if you build a project commercial real estate in a qualified zone, the owner that is leasing that property is a QOZB, a qualified opportunity zone business, and can raise tax advantage capital for the construction and operation of the building. Check number one. Here's the double benefit. That tenant or tenants that lease that property also can meet the definition of a qualified opportunity zone business. The regulations, without going through all the details, make, here's the simplest little thing, they tell you if you're a tenant in a building and you own the tenant improvements, which typically you do, the upfit, guess what? That's a qualified asset. They just rope fiat. By fiat, the government, the Treasury said, that's a qualified asset. So you're beginning to see the piece of the puzzle, and this was what was intended by the legislation, to bring not only the capital investment into the zone, but the economic investment as well as far as jobs. So I was at a, a, a round table this morning with a lot of the developers here in Columbus, and that was the thing people really got excited about, was the ability, once I construct it, to market it and bring in tenants. And, and, and really, the rules are flexible. So it doesn't, there was a concern that would have to be a startup business. Well, who wants to give tax-deferred capital to a startup business that may not be around in 12 months. It can be an existing business that redomiciles, and now all of a sudden you begin, this is the game and the thing that economic development people get very excited about is attracting companies with jobs and that are going to stay for a long time. Those things are all back on the table now with the new regs. It's pretty exciting. Yeah, it is. Jen, thoughts on this, on this, this particular component outside of the real estate investment? As a real estate attorney, yeah, <laughs> I have yeah. to take a pass out of ignorance yeah. on that. Okay, Stephen. Well, and uh, right, uh, Ashland, Kentucky, and then, uh, you know, borders the river with uh, South Ohio, there's a small little aluminum plant that's intended to come out of the ground. You might have heard it's called Brady, so it's all public knowledge. And uh, just so happened that's in an opportunity zone. And if, in fact, that plant, which it sounds like it might be announced here soon that it's going to officially come out of the ground, if that plant comes out of the ground in an opportunity zone, there are going to be industries and feeder industries that will feed that plant that are in opportunity zones. So you will see real estate and trades or businesses that will clearly take advantage of this incentive in that community. Very, very good. Well, if you would go ahead and thank our panel uh, for giving us some great insights today.